Yeah, I hope you can see it. Great. Yeah. yeah, so also from the side um, of our organizing committee and also our local IFSA committee from Eberswalde, very warm welcome to this uh, very, very special remote online NERM. And yeah, although we're still very heartbroken that the actual NERM cannot take place, uh, we're very happy that we can hold this event and we hope that you can enjoy it. And we also hope that you're all healthy, home happy, also your families and your friends. And um, yeah, this Friday um, is the so-called learning day that is organized by yeah, our organizing committee. And before the actual presentation starts, we want to shortly tell you about some backgrounds of the NERM. Um, like for example, our organizing committee. Um, this presentation is yeah, given by me, Hannah, and later on Lara will continue. And here you can see, uh, the organizing committee and you know might know some faces from uh, some international events and you might recognize them. Interesting thing is that actually none of these people here are forestry students. Uh, we're all students of um, a study program called International Forest Ecosystem Management, uh, which has many, many um, similarities to forestry but has a more um, international focus. Uh, but of course, uh, we also have uh, some forestry students uh, in our local committee. Um, and here we wanted just to depict a few of our activities we're usually doing. So we're organizing, for example, guest lectures about relevant topics like uh, deforestation or hunting. We're also doing um, different excursions um, close to Ibaswalde. In the upper right corner, you can see a picture from last NERM, uh, where also four of our members participated and where we applied uh, for organizing the NERM in 2020. Uh, this took place in Wales and was really much fun. And also we um, participate in international, uh, yeah, I already told this. Um, and here in the uh, left corner, you can see two of our members on the um, International Day of Forests. And recently we also started to uh, produce an own podcast series um, with topics about yeah, forests and environment and interesting guests. Um, yeah, that's it so far. And now I will also tell a few words about our former sponsors who were supposed to uh, sponsor NERM because some of them are really important actors in German forestry and are worth knowing. Uh, so our biggest sponsor was our own university for uh, sustainable development in Eberswalde and Lara will tell you more about our university soon. Um, our second sponsor was um, the Eva Meyer Stiel Foundation. You might know Stiel from, you know, the chainsaws and this company actually has a foundation um, which tries to identify social challenges um, with exper experts and try to contribute to solutions. Uh, they address future issues that reach far beyond Germany, like the fight against cancer, um, sustainable t technologies, um, healthy forests, as well as art and culture. So they have a really broad range of topics they support. Um, the Bund Deutscher Forstleute is uh, a trade union for forest workers and those working in the forestry sector. They represent freelancers, employees, civil servants, um, and so on. And they also represent foresters in training and retired foresters. Um, the Ligna is a trade fair for wood processing and woodworking. It takes place every two years in the city of Hannover in Germany. And their topics are forestry, sawmill technology, wood-based materials, bioenergy from wood, and much more. And I'm pretty sure you all know PEFC, um, the program for the endorsement of forest certification, uh, which is yeah, a global alliance of national uh, forest certification systems. And yes, yeah, a non-profit, non-governmental organization they are dedicated to promoting sustainable forest management through um, yeah, certification and third party certification. Um, yeah, that's it from my side. Now I'll give the word to Lara. 
Okay, I try to change my screen as fast as possible. Can you see this? Oh, oh. Oops. Awesome. So I hope you all can see this. Thank you, Hannah, for presenting our committee. And now I want to tell you more about our small city, Eberswalde, and our university. Um, yeah, for the ones that unfortunately couldn't get the chance to get to know our city and our university. So here you can see the red point is where we are located. Uh, Lara, we can't see your screen. No? No. Oh. Try it again. Yeah. Perfect. Mm. Now? Now we can see. Okay. So yeah, Eberswald is here at the red point. And when we have a closer look, we see that we are pretty close to Berlin and also pretty close to the Polish border. And now here is the marketplace of Eberswalde, which is in the center. And on the right lower co corner, you can see now the emblem of Eberswalde. On the ground are two wild boars that are typically shown as a symbol for Eberswalde and its forests. You also can see the oak tree and above the red eagle that stands for Brandenburg, that is the area around Berlin. And yeah, Eberswalde has 42,000 inhabitants, which is not a lot, but Eberswalde is also a place for the foundation of various initiatives. For example, the transition drive or Wandelbar, which means changeable. And also Eberswalde is called transition town. So it means to change and to transform from within the society to a more sustainable living and way and a, uh, yeah, for a yeah, better society from within. And in my view, that is pretty characteristic for Eberswalde. And here you can see a sticker that we got in the first semester. Um, yeah, with some values Eberswalde stands for. It is in German, but I will shortly translate you some words, for example, the forest or diversity or green, and again, the wild boar. And of course, it's very beautifully painted, but just to give you an overview of the city. And now we come to our university, the University for Sustainable Development and a short overview of the history. So it was founded in 1830 as a Höhere Forst Lehranstalt, that is something like a forest academy um, that moved from Berlin to Eberswalde because they needed some practical relation and some forests where they could work on. Uh, unfortunately, in the GDR, the forest academy had to close and was just re-established in 1992. And just since 2010, it has the name as University for Sustainable Development. So it's not a long phase since we stand like that for sustainability. But I think in <coughs> most years, <coughs> we developed a lot into a direction to a more sustainable way. And on, at our university, we have two campuses. First, the city campus with the Faculty of Landscape Management and Nature Conservation and the Faculty of Sustainable Business. But since we are all more into forestry, here we have the forest campus. On the picture, you can see the Mensa. It's the uh, place where we used to eat. And you can see that the place is really crowded. So it looks like this in summer, maybe on an event. Yeah, uh, there's the Faculty of Forest and Environment where you can study forestry or like 
the most of our committee uh, international forest ecosystem management and moreover there's the faculty of wood engineering yeah, and if you want to learn more about our study courses you can just visit the website or if you have any further questions please ask and then i thank you for your attention to here and i hope this was a good basis for the next uh, presentation yeah Stop finishing this. So if you have <laughs> questions about the first part, you can either write them in the chat or just put on your micro. If not, we will just go on with the next part, the main part. Seems like there are some questions or you just put the, somebody press the question sign. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sandra and Daniel? No, I was just clapping. Ah, thank you. <laughs> okay, then I think we can uh, continue. And this also goes for, for the rest of the presentation. If you have any uh, questions, just write them in the chat. We will collect all the questions and then we can ask all of them at the end of the presentation. And yeah, now we finally want to introduce to you the main part, um, the presentation on silvicultural challenges in our region in um, Brandenburg, the federal state of Brandenburg, where Eberswalde is located. And Professor Peter Spartelf is um, a yeah, professor for applied silviculture and a lecturer at our university. And his profession concentrates on close to nature forestry, continuous cover forestry and forest conversion. Um, and yeah, I would say, Professor Spartelf, the floor is yours. And we really hope you will um, enjoy this informative presentation. Thank you very much, Hannah. So first I should go to my presentation. You can all see my presentation? No. No? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Then I should once again, yes. Um, just a moment. share my screen with you now it should work yeah? yes okay perfect. so once again it's a pleasure to talk to you um, i'm very delighted to uh, having the opportunity to give a lecture on silviculture on applied silviculture which i call silvicultural challenges in northeastern germany and brandenburg we already saw where Everswalde is located uh, and uh, the campus was introduced and the city was introduced and uh, I have to remind one fact that Everswalde is also the place where IUFRO was founded. So the leading network of forest research organization, organizations was founded in 1892 at Everswalde. So that is a great thing and uh, has to be mentioned. So you can see in, in this slide that our Brandenburg federal state is characterized by wonderful landscapes with a lot of forests and a lot of lakes. But on the other hand, um, we, we have a, a very dry area here at Brandenburg in the eastern part of Germany. So we are rich in lakes, but very poor in precipitation. And here again, Everswalde at the very eastern border of Brandenburg. Uh, and what I want to do with you is now to, to go a little bit through the forest types uh, of uh, Brandenburg to show you some slides of typical forest stands in Brandenburg to introduce the forest activity a little bit and then to focus on some major parts of silviculture which is 
the tree species selection and uh, some aspects of silvicultural management. And uh, finally, I will uh, lay an emphasis on close to nature forestry or continuous cover forestry and forest conversion. So that is what I want to do. I shortened my presentation very much. Uh, uh, what I uh, presented to, to Hannah last week. Uh, so to maybe be able to finish in, let's say, one hour at least with the questions, okay? <clears throat> yes, the diversity of forests in Brandenburg. Uh, dear students, uh, first have a look, uh, have, have a look at the natural forest cover. Uh, on the left side, uh, the state of Brandenburg and the different colors represent the uh, tree species of the natural forest cover. We can also say the tree species of the potential natural vegetation. And you can see a, a green zone in the northern part of Brandenburg. This is the capital of Germany. And you have a, a more yellow brown zone uh, in the middle, in the center, and uh, quite brown, and also uh, some blue spots in the south. So you have a, a beach corridor here in the more humid part of Brandenburg in the north, and then in the center east, the natural forests are comprising more oak stands, oak with lime and uh, hornbeam. And in the south, we have also some natural pine stands, maybe five to 10% on the sand dunes. And um, we have also a special case here in Brandenburg. We have a lot of peat swamp uh, or peatland stands with alder as a tree species, maybe two or 3%. And the most famous region here is the Spreewald area. And on the right side, you have the current tree species composition, which has a high share of pine. So pine has more than 70% uh, still in Brandenburg. And here you can see, or you can uh, estimate the challenge of forest conversion, uh, which is already occurring at the moment, but which is also planned for the future to convert these pure, even-aged homogeneous stands of pine into mixed structure stands with pine, but mainly also uh, with broadleaf tree species. Yes, some typical uh, stands. We have a, a mixed young stand of pine and also other species, oak. This is a close to nature forest stand in South Brandenburg. Um, uh, forest enterprise committed to the so-called ANW, which is the association of uh, close to nature forest owners in Germany. Um, and uh, you see a nice variety already of species of mixed, uh, of a mixed stand. Uh, and um, this is also a stand originating from natural regeneration. Here on the left side, a stand in Corinne, uh, a typical age class stand, uh, maybe originating in the era before the GDR times, but these stands are or were uh, established uh, with a high plant number. Uh, they were pure stands, even age stands, and this stand is regenerated with a method of shelter wood cutting. So you can see the canopy quite uniformly opened. This is still a typical method of regenerating naturally our pine stands, shelter wood cutting in the form of large scale shelter wood was introduced into Brandenburg or Prussia at the time by Hartig, one of the great personalities in forestry at the beginning of the 19th century. Then we have beach stands in the northern part, in the more humid part of Brandenburg. Uh, on the right side, you can see a beach stand again in regeneration with some 
old trees, mature trees with some microstructures, which are very important for harboring a lot of animal tree species. Uh, so the question of structural or stand legacies uh, has to be posed here. Uh, so the idea is today in beach forestry to keep or to maintain at least a certain number of old mature trees and also snags or coarse woody debris, so-called stand legacies, to emulate to a certain extent uh, the uh, natural disturbance or the natural development of these stands. On the left side, you can see Again, a quite nicely structured stand, beach stand in Corinne, um, uh, which has uh, quite a nice understory and has good structural elements uh, in this forest, something which uh, the foresters like very much today. And we are working in this direction to, uh, to establish and to, to manage more heterogeneous mixed stands. We will see a little bit later the advantages of the mixture question, why this is so much in the center or in the core of our close to nature forest management. Oak stands, we have a region in Brandenburg in the Freienwalde area where there is a quite in the middle of a, a beach of a natural beach area, uh, there is a, an area of uh, valuable oak stands, so stands with valuable tree individuals of oak. This is due to the long-term commitment in that area of just a few foresters who managed this area or these stands according to the state of the art of valuable oak tree management. So they uh, managed uh, the stands in order to uh, to establish quite nicely uh, pruned, naturally pruned uh, uh, stems at the beginning of the stem and then they uh, heavily thinned these uh, individuals in order to to achieve big trees with a very good quality. So this is not typical for Brandenburg but it's a, a special case also in Brandenburg, we have nice oak stands with high quality. The uh, Spreewald area uh, with the alder stands and um, the question of conservation of these stands for the purpose of accumulating the carbon which is stored in these wet areas is a very crucial one. We know that uh, in uh, these uh, peat swamp forests, a lot of carbon is stored and in the past decades, a lot of these uh, forests or uh, regions were drained and uh, a lot of carbon was therefore released. Uh, so these stands have to be, uh, have to be conserved. And uh, here we can see a picture of the Blage Fen area, which is one of uh, the oldest uh, nature conservation area in our region of Brandenburg. Then, <clears throat> of course, our foresters have introduced some tree species from abroad and the major exotic, so-called exotic tree species, which was uh, introduced in the 19th century from North America was Douglas fir. And we see some nice Douglas fir stands in the Corinne area, but also in other spots of Brandenburg. Very often they were established due to uh, some spleens of foresters who wanted to uh, especially uh, establish this or that exotic tree species for the purpose of uh, growth acceleration, but also sometimes for aesthetic uh, purposes. Um, but today, Douglas fir in Brandenburg, the canopy area, just we have 1% of Douglas fir. And the other um, exotic tree species are far below 1%. So uh, 
So it's still a very small area, but these are promising tree species because in times of climate change, we hope that these species can enrich our forest and can turn them into more resilient forests, especially if we lose some major components in our forests, not so much in Brandenburg, but you know it in Western or South Germany, uh, we lose at the moment very much Norway spruce. And maybe it's, uh, Douglas fir could substitute to a certain extent, a very vulnerable Norway spruce. Uh, another special case in Brandenburg is the restoration question. So to restore um, the open cast uh, lightnet mines is an obligation the enterprises uh, which work there have. So they already began uh, in the 1930s, 40s and 50s to restore these huge areas uh, where uh, brown coal um, was uh, uh, harvested. Um, and uh, they use different tree species. Um, they use pine, but also broadleaf tree species, and also alder for restor restoring this de completely degraded area. This is typical for Brandenburg, in South Brandenburg, in the so called Lausitz area. But it's also somewhat uh, a case in Western Germany, in the Cologne area, in the Aachen area. But uh, we do not have only our typical stands, our major tree species in Brandenburg, which are Scots pine, which are European beech, uh, sessile oak, Douglas fir, alder, and other valuable broadleaf tree species. Our forests are also characterized more and more by catastrophic events. And this is just behind our forest campus where um, the storm Xavier in October uh, 2017 has uh, damaged uh, quite a significant area. And uh, the question of storm damages and how to how to cope with these damages, how, how to, to uh, spread uh, the risks and how to cope with the risk or live with risk, or in other words, how to use a good crisis for forest uh, rejuvenation. That is a, a major question we have uh, all over Europe. Remember the huge storm, for example, in the northern Italian Alps, where uh, a, a vast region was, was damaged also by a storm in 2019. So storm damages is a, a sign of catastrophic events in forestry, in our forest, but also the fire question. When I studied fire wasn't a question at all in my studies at Freiburg University, but today uh, after the second drought summer now the fire question is on the agenda and uh, we have a, a nice project here in the Trojan Brietzen area where our university and Professor Ibisch with his Econics Institute cooperates with the city of Trojan Brietzen to establish a more natural forest after this huge fire which uh, touched more than several hundred of hectares of, of land. Uh, what you can see here is a, uh, in, in some other spots of this Treuenbritzen area, you can see large scale clear cuts or vast areas and the plantation of Scots pine. Yeah? So what we are seeking for is alternatives to the establishment of pure even age stands. So restoration with uh, using the natural processes and establishing mixed structures forests. Yeah, some figures of uh, forestry in Brandenburg. Uh, we have a lot of Scots pine still, which is due to history in the restoration period in the 19th century. 
people a forested the vast areas the open areas with a robust tree species some economic uh, i would say uh, yeah thoughts or schools promoted the establishment of pure evenate stands of pine and spruce which was the so-called soil expectation value school maybe you have heard boden reinertragslehre in german um, but this is a legacy we have in brandenburg uh, we are now working with these stands and converting them we have a small amount of oak and beech and then we have these these other tree species just in in a minor size we have uh, some, yeah, forests we can really characterize as very close to nature in Brandenburg. Um, and we have a lot of private forest owners. Um, so we have also, when we talk about uh, forest conversion and uh, the adaptation of uh, forests to climate change, we have to access the private forest owners and not only the state forest uh, and we have a, a quite a, a good timber industry some locations where we have uh, hotspots of timber processing industries for example in Barut in south brandenburg yes let's go ahead um, dear students with some aspects of silvicultural management um, so uh, first of all you are aware uh, of course of the fact that uh, foresters since 1811 or since 1830 when the eberswalde higher education uh, school for forestry was established uh, the question of site adapted forestry was a very important question and for some reasons in Everswalde mainly due to the presence of Feil which was one of the major persons in the 19th century uh, the question of the local influence of the site on forestry was a, a major question and uh, so forth uh, in Everswalde something developed what we call the Everswalde school where Pfeil was the first representative of this school and uh, people foresters focused on site adapted uh, tree species selection so tree species which are able to develop their full growth potential on a site and regenerate naturally and species that do not exhibit uh, too much risks or do deteriorate the site conditions so the two aspects the one aspect the growth potential and on the other hand the risks the risk minimization or the risk reduction then we are working in the direction of site adapted tree species selection which is a fundamental principle of course of uh, forestry and uh, in Brandenburg uh, until today forest establishment is realized on the basis of our regional climate classification and the site units just have a look to the site units you can see on the <clears throat> left map the distribution of the nutrition levels from A to R. So the more red the color, the more orange the color, the more medium or poor the sites are. And we have just some um, spots of rich sites near Eberswalde and in the Korean area. These are so called end moraines where we have a mosaic of more rich substrate and we have the site levels of K and R. But normally in Brandenburg, we have very poor or quite poor sites. And concerning precipitation, you can see on the right curve, the water deficit. So the 
current evapotranspiration minus the potential evapotranspiration. It's a very important um, characteristic of, uh, the, of the probability of drought in an area. And again, the more red the colors are, the more um, vulnerable to drought some sites are. And you can uh, see that uh, we have um, some crucial areas in, in Brandenburg with uh, some um, yeah, um, sites which, uh, which are very uh, prone to, to, to drought stress. <clears throat> so what, what do we do? We have to match the tree species with the site conditions. So we have our site information on the maps. Uh, we have the, the site distribution and we have to match the species or the so-called development types. And I put here some typical development types for oak, for sessile oak. And I show to you the matching or the <clears throat> attempt to match the oak forest development types here from the more rich site spectrum to the poor site spectrum. So oak in combination with maple or other uh, noble broadleaf tree species uh, is uh, for the very good sites in Brandenburg, for the moraine sites, the end moraines, whereas oak, pure oak or oak with pine is for the more poor stands. So this is what the foresters have to do. So we have to bring together the tree species with its requirements for <clears throat> the site and the conditions of the site uh, with the site units and the characteristics of these sites in terms of nutrition and on the other hand, in terms of the soil water status, yeah? the combination of the letter and the figure. In our forest management, <clears throat> when we have once established our stands, the mixed stands, these so-called forest development types, which are planning categories um, with a leading tree species, which is in our example in the last slide, oak, uh, then we very much stick to the so-called crop tree concept. So the selection, of future crop trees, so-called future crop trees, once we can estimate the quality of a tree. Then we select a very good individual within the stand. Um, we can select future crop trees according to quality and vigor, uh, but we can also select future crop trees according to habitat characteristics. And as you can imagine, uh, we have in the zones between the future crop trees, they are distributed to a certain extent quite regularly in the stand. They have good quality characteristics. They have a, a very good vigor. So they take part at the emerging canopy part. Uh, and once we have selected these three species, we can especially focus our management on these tree species and on these tree individuals. So this is the crop tree concept, which is recommended, by the way, nearly in all the uh, silvicultural guidelines, not only in Brandenburg, but also in the other federal states of Germany. <clears throat> and again, the selection criteria for future crop trees is first vitality, uh, then quality, and then distribution. So let's go a little bit more into detail with respect to the uh, production strategies in the Brandenburg forests. You can imagine, dear students, that um, there is a certain um, advantage for 
Germany or in the German federal states not to focus very much on, on mass production. So the so-called pulpwood strategy or mass production strategy is typical for plantation forestry in the tropics and subtropics where the volume growth of a stand is optimized. Maybe you remember from your studies Asman's theory uh, to uh, keep a certain amount uh, of stems on an area to optimize the volume increment uh, and not to uh, uh, reduce uh, the stocking below a certain threshold. This is typical for the pulpwood strategy, so the optimization of volume production. But our competitive advantage in Central Europe, in Brandenburg, is to produce valuable timber. How is valuable timber characterized? Um, you can see in the slide or in the figure above that um, valuable timber first is big timber. These are big trees with a good diameter at breast height, maybe 50, maybe 60 centimeters at breast height. And these are trees with large grounds because large grounds produce a good increment. So the ground is the, the motor uh, for the, the tree increment. And you can distinguish, if you look at the graph, two stages for this valuable timber production or the clearwood production. The two stages are uh, first the young stand stage where we have a high number of young trees, of small trees. And these trees are heavily competing among each other. And the effect is a, a natural pruning of these stands. So here we have a focus on quality production. Due to the natural pruning, we can finally, at the end of this stage, find uh, stems free from knots uh, at heights until six, eight, or 10 meters. It depends how long is the first stage. And in the second stage, you can see our focus, our emphasis is laid on the diameter acceleration. These trees, and once they are selected as future crop trees, these trees are heavily released so that the diameter of these trees can grow very fast. Yeah? So we have two stages, one after the other, because both together is impossible from a, a growth and yield standpoint. You cannot, on the one hand, keep the stands very close for natural pruning uh, acceleration, and on the other hand, to heavily thin the future crop trees for growing uh, in diameter, so for accelerating the diameter growth. So this is something uh, fundamental, this two-stage strategy of clearwood of high-value timber production. You can apply, by the way, for all the tree species. You can adapt for the, the long living or long-term management in uh, the forests of Central Europe, but you can also develop a model with this uh, concept in teak plantations, for example, or other uh, plantation forestry management in the tropics or subtropics. So this is the, the approach for timber production in the Brandenburgian forests. So we first, in the tree species, which have a capacity for natural pruning, accelerate the natural pruning, and then we focus very much on selecting appropriate future job trees and thinning them in order to, to promote the diameter increment of these future crop trees. Here you can see the first stage. This is a, an oak stand, a sessile oak stand, where you uh, see quite still uh, 
a certain number of trees uh, competing among each other and, uh, so to speak, um, promoting the natural pruning process. We can go into these stands and select future crop trees once we have achieved a stem free from branches of normally six to eight meters. This is one fourth or one third of the whole tree length or the whole tree height in our uh, stands in Brandenburg where the mature stands achieve heights of 30, 35 meters, etc. So this is the first stage, but you, the silviculturists uh, among you, they can also recognize that something is lacking in this stand still, which is the understory. And I come to this later. We need for valuable timber production in oak, we need some understory to improve the soil conditions on the one hand, but on the other hand to, uh, to train the major tree species to become a valuable and a big uh, stem. And these species we call trainer species in the understory of these valuable stems. We will see in a few minutes. <clears throat> this is a picture of, a, of an old tree, of a mature target tree. And you can see the crown size such a tree uh, can, can develop and the crown width. And this is very important because with the crown dimensions, we can derive the number of future crop trees we select on an area, on a hectare, for example. Imagine a whole stand, a hectare, and measuring the crown sizes of some trees or the trees on this hectare uh, must be mature trees which have achieved the target diameter and then you can derive with the sum of the crown projection areas of this stand uh, and the standing space such a tree requires such an individual mature tree requires, you can uh, derive or you can calculate the maximum number of future crop trees you can select on an area. Yeah. So with oak or with beech, you calculate some 50, 60, 70 future crop trees per hectare. And what you need for this calculation you need the standing space, which is expressed by the ground dimension of a mature uh, future crop tree. So this is a, a core element of a stand management of timber production of silvicultural intervention in uh, our Brandenburg forests. This is also written down in our forest or silvicultural guidelines, so-called green uh, uh, book of the Brandenburg Forest Administration. And, uh, uh, but this you can find also in other state forest administration guidelines. So the crop tree concept and the two-stage approach for high value timber production and the selection of future crop trees, a certain maximum number of future crop trees according to the standing space requirements. Okay, so in the next part, the students, we go ahead and look for this very important and very relevant question of forest conversion and continuous cover forestry. And Eberswalde is a very good place for continuous cover forestry because in Eberswalde, Alfred Möller lived at the beginning of the 20th century, or he, 
he worked um, at that time at our uh, forestry school, which then in the 1920s turned into a forestry university. And Alfred Müller was a biologist who came from Brazil and studied the tropical and subtropical forests there, the heterogeneous, very rich, structurally rich forests. He studied and he came back and found very pure, homogeneous, uh, poor in structure, uh, forest, pine forest in Brandenburg. And um, he uh, was a little bit disappointed because he could not apply his theory of Dauerwald. It's a German expression, but in English we use continuous cover forestry because he, he was seeing the forest as an organism which has to be develop very cautiously into the direction of a permanent forest using natural regeneration, not opening the forest too much, not uh, using the method of clear cutting, but using single tree interventions to develop the forest. And that is the, in, in a few words, the theory of continuous cover forestry, which is a very important at that time, a very small, but in the silvicultural history, a very important develop, development line of silviculture in Germany. Um, Möller died very early in 1922, and he could not uh, help to spread his ideas of continuous cover forestry. Uh, so other uh, advocates of the conventional forestry approach took over, uh, especially in Everswalde, and uh, the development line of permanent forest or continuous cover forest then emerged again in the 1980s and 1990s after um, having realized uh, that uh, it is not uh, very helpful or advantages to work with pure homogeneous stands, but to convert them into mixed and more resilient stands. So Müller, important for Everswalde, you know, he worked at the Sonnenvilla. Uh, he worked and, and lived there. And uh, he was also the director of our forestry academy. When we go to the silvicultural systems, you all know on the left side, the uh, clear cutting uh, system and the even age system, such as the shelter wood cutting and the, the strip cut. And when we turn to the right side, <clears throat> we find the group selection cut and the selection cut. These are uneven age systems, or we can, uh, with good reasons, group them into uh, the, the uneven aged category. And uh, in continuous cover forestry, we very much focused, focus on the uneven aged silvicultural systems. So the selection forest, um, which you find in the more mountainous areas of Germany, um, but also on this slide, you can see in Thüringen, we, we can find some uh, forest owners working with beach selection forests. And the selection forest is the the, the archetype of a, of a continuous cover forest and is characterized by the negative j shape diameter distribution curve. You may know this from uh, forest growth and yield or forest inventory. Uh, so you have a lot of small trees, some medium-sized trees, and only a few very large trees on the same area, on a small area. And that is a selection forest. 
uh, which is a uh, every selection forest is a is a continuous cover forest, but not every continuous cover forest is a selection forest, because selection forests are normally characterized by conifer trees, with this exception in Thüringen, and they occur in the mountainous areas in South Germany, uh, in areas with a high amount of private farm forests, yeah? So the question in the last 20 and 30 years in Brandenburg and in many uh, forest areas in Germany was how to cope with the even-aged stands, how to convert these even-aged forests into mixed forests, structured forests, so into a continuous cover forest. Um, that is the, what, what I meant with the small forest development line or silvicultural development line of, of nature or natural forest management or close to nature forestry and continuous cover forestry, which was taken up uh, at the end of the 20th century uh, in the conventional forestry in Germany because the foresters saw that um, many of these uh, pure forests, they were heavily damaged. We had the question of forest decline in the 1980s and 1990s, and the foresters wanted to do something against uh, the damages in these more conventional forests. And for this reason, the forest conversion activity began. And uh, the question for Brandenburg uh, was where to concentrate the efforts and the activities of forest conversion and to what extent forest conversion should be uh, practiced. And here you can see <clears throat> some steps of forest conversion. Uh, you can see the, um, the focus, the emphasis of forest conversion is laid in the pine stands. So uh, the pure pine stands, which were established uh, in the restoration period of uh, forest establishment in Northern Germany and also in the GDR times, they uh, will be converted into mixed stands, especially using broadleaf tree species, using oak and using pine to develop mixed and structurally uh, diverse forests. Uh, here you can see uh, people are focusing, are concentrating on um, stands older than 80 years on very poor sites. And uh, in Brandenburg, it was calculated a total area of 150,000 hectares where there is a currently feasible um, stocking of pine stands, which can be converted. And this process is, is now uh, already several years old. And of course it, should be and will be accelerated in order to uh, adapt these forests also to climate change. At the beginning of forest conversion, climate change wasn't a very important question, but uh, today, of course, the climate change question, the resilience question is very important uh, for the reason why we uh, convert our forests into mixtures, into diverse mixtures. So a common element of these new, more adapted forests is the mixture question. And in a, several cost actions in Europe, we, we uh, worked on the mixture question. We developed uh, definitions 
and research pers perspectives in mixed stands. We analyzed mixed stands in gradients from Spain to the Baltic countries and looked whether mixed stands perform uh, well in comparison to, to the pure stands or if, is there a so-called overyielding of mixed forests in comparison with pure forests. So there was a, a huge activity, uh, research activity in uh, mixed forests all over Europe. We exchanged ourselves also in uh, some research approaches, etc., and um, exchange inventories and, and uh, our facts and figures on mixed stands. And at the end, we, we could publish quite a nice variety of articles on the question of mixed forests in Europe. So if you go to some advantages of mixtures, I'm sure that you are aware of uh, one advantage, which is the functional uh, redundancy of mixed stands. If you look um, in the figure above uh, the part A, uh, you have um, stands very rich in species, so a functional diversity, which is high, but a functional redundancy, which is low. You have only two tree species with different functional traits. Yeah? But if you go to the species rich stand below, so with uh, five uh, species, which are not functional redundant, or you, excuse me, where you have a high functional redundancy, um, then you have a situation if losing one or two species, uh, you have still a stand with a certain variety of functional traits and functional traits with relation to adaptation, they are important to make the stands uh, more resilient to drought stress and to the negative effects of climate change. So the functional redundancy in mixed stands is very important. If we look at the mixtures, dear students, we develop in Brandenburg, we can uh, distinguish between the intimate or single tree mixtures, then the spatial mixtures. So you have here the single tree mixtures one by one, uh, a, a transition zone of row mixtures or small groups. And then we have the, the spatial or group mixture, which is very important and which is recommended, excuse me, in many silvicultural guidelines. And we can also distinguish between so-called vertical mixtures. So we have this gradient of mixtures with increasing growing space per species, but also increasing competition on the uh, horizontal axis. So these monospecific patches and these groups can be recommended if we have species very different in growth pattern and where the natural pruning capacity is very high so that we can develop uh, of out of one cell out of one patch at least one future crop tree and on the, the other hand in these uh, single tree mixtures we have a one-to-one -one, a mixture which is very good uh, in stands where we have a, um, a similar growth pattern among the, the tree species and where, for example, the trees have to be artificially pruned in order to produce a high quality. Here you can see in this, question, in this graph <clears throat> in a very nice beach stand, 
in the Corin Forest District, you can see a, a group, a femal patch of beech. So this stand is regenerated again into beech uh, with a, a patch structure, uh, which is typical in a close to nature approach for beach management. Uh, so you can find this very frequently in the forest districts uh, near Eberswalde, where many foresters are committed to uh, close to nature beach forest management. So this is a group mixture. And what silviculturists do for establishing mixed stands in general, they have two opportunities. One opportunity is the temporal separation of tree species. So this is the question of underplanting with a certain time lag. Species, in this case it's silver fir, uh, is underplanted uh, under a beech stand in order to introduce the second layer of the mixed uh, stand. Yeah. Um, so this is called underplanting. It can have two functions. First, the function of um, ameliorating the stand in terms of litter amelioration. Uh, this is uh, more for service functions. And the second perspective of underplanting is to introduce the next forest generation to uh, establish a, a change in stocking in tree species. So to introduce canopy tree species via the plantation, the artificial planting of um, these species under the canopy of the major stand. So this is one key technique, the temporal separation of tree species. And the second is the spatial separation. That is what I showed you with the patches as an alternative to the one-to-one -one mixture. Um, so in the cases I told you, when we have a good um, natural pruning capacity, and on the other hand, when uh, we can develop out of a patch uh, valuable trees, valuable timber. We can use this, these femal patches or the cluster planting. This is natural, this is artificial, uh, as a method to introduce the mixed tree species in a stand. So the temporal separation or the spatial separation are two key approaches to um, introduce the mixed stand component. Um, we have other types of mixtures. Uh, one uh, dis, uh, distinction is the mixtures to increase productivity or economic performance. These are mixtures where you have two tree species which are producing uh, to, a, to a high level um, and increasing the economic performance of a stand. And then we have a mixing tree species with service functions, so-called trainer trees. This is the tree species in the understory, which was brought via underplanting or the so-called nurse crops. Nurse crops are stands where uh, first a so-called nurse crop is established with pioneer tree species. And uh, this nurse crop um, is um, very important and uh, indispensable to provide some shelter uh, uh, for climatic extremes for the main crop, which then is planted or is underplanted under the uh, nurse crop. So we have the second distinction, mixtures of 
uh, tree species which produce uh, in the same order or magnitude and uh, at mixing tree species with service functions of the trainer trees and the nurse crops. Uh, again, the permanent stable mixture here, a large and beech intermixed two uh, tree species with different niches, so they occupy different niches and uh, therefore show different silvicultural traits. And with this approach, you can also produce a so-called overyielding effect where the mixed uh, stand produces more than the sum of the two uh, pure components. That's a true overyielding effect, which you can uh, have if the two tree species are to a certain extent complementary. And on this side with our students from Everswalde, some two years ago, we have a valuable oak stand and the trainer species here uh, in the oak stand is beech and hornbeam, so that oak grows in good qualities. Uh, the beeches and the hornbeams are protecting um, the stems so that lateral sprouts or water sprouts are not producing or are not becoming that vigorous. This, or this is the function of trainer species. So we have these two mixtures. And again, the, the overyielding question, you can see in a, a study of Hans Breitsch from Munich and his group, that when we uh, increase the tree species richness from one species to two or more, and uh, are coming from lower site qualities, so from poor stands, uh, to uh, rich stands, we can influence the productivity. You can see with already one or two more species, we can increase the productivity compared to the pure stand. And especially we can work or we can see this facilitation effect so that two species facilitate growth among each other uh, in stands or on sites with a low uh, site quality or site fertility. When we move from uh, the poorer site spectrum to uh, rich sites, we can uh, see that species are more heavily competing so that we lose the facilitation uh, effect and uh, we, we will have more competition among these tree species. So this is a, an important approach of a study which was uh, developed from our Munich colleagues. Uh, so the question of the economic overyielding of mixed stands. So we have both. We have the resilience part. Uh, mixed forests are more resilient. If you look at the meta studies and mixed forests are very often producing better compared to the pure stands. That is again the nurse crop I just wanted to show to you. Here we have the nurse species which are protecting the target species. Uh, so we have these trainer effects in mixed stands um, with the nurse crop. If we look uh, at our silvicultural gradient, we, we can um, see uh, if we encompass uh, many situations where silviculture is practiced from natural forests or more or less natural forests to agroforests, you can um, estimate that continuous cover forestry or close to nature forestry in Brandenburg is located here. Uh, so in the part of uh, more 
ecological complex forests with longer rotations where we naturally regenerate the forests, where we develop mixed stands, etc. Whereas the conventional forests are located here on the plantation side or on the agroforestry side. So we are here with our continuous cover forests. <clears throat> In this management gradient, so we uh, maintain the diversity of the stands and the complexity, but we may lose productivity or economic return instead. Yeah. Semi-natural silviculture or close to nature silviculture. And with this slide, I want to close my uh, presentation is just one term we use. So you can see close to nature is a term used in Germany, continuous cover forestry also, but also our British colleagues, if they uh, talk about uh, silviculture approaches without clear cut, they say continuous cover forestry. In some countries, Italy, systemic silviculture is used. Uh, in North America and South America, it's retention forestry. So the emphasis uh, which is laid on the individuals which are retained in a stand instead of the individuals which are cut. Uh, again, also in Australia or multi-purpose forestry in China. So we have different terms for the same approach um, in silviculture, the continuous cover forestry. And if we want to take some messages home, uh, the question of conversion into uh, continuous cover stands um, is or has to do with avoiding clear cuts. So with using maybe uh, all silvicultural systems in the part of uneven age management. So the group selection system and the single tree intervention is the focus on mixed forest and the increase of the share of natural tree species without uh, um, uh, losing also some amount of exotic tree species, especially for uh, increasing the resilience of stands, uh, the, the participation uh, of exotic tree species can be very useful. We have uh, the use of natural regeneration in the continuous cover forestry systems. So natural regeneration, which is for free and gives you a very good potential of the next stand generation in terms of the tree number, in terms of maybe the species and the silvicultural traits related with this. And what we need in continuous cover stands is a continuous intervention. So we cannot leave the stands unmanaged, but we have to intervene in order to maintain the structure. Uh, this is something we already know from the planter forests. Uh, and we should avoid as far as possible the damages on soil and the remaining stand. And what is very important, we cannot uh, uh, build forests uh, according to the principles of continuous cover forestry without controlling the deer populations. So we must uh, reduce the deer population to a minimum threshold so that the natural regeneration of our trees uh, can work yeah, without uh, artificial measures without fences. So the deer question is a crucial question for establishing CCF uh, systems in Brandenburg, but also in other um, states of Germany. So here one slide again with the potential 
of trees inside a control fence and what is the situation outside the fence. So the deer question is a precondition. So this, the solution of the deer con uh, question is a precondition for continuous cover forestry. With this slide, I want to close. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope uh, uh, some insights of silviculture in Brandenburg I could transport to you. Uh, I apologize a little bit for my voice. I still have some slight problems with my voice. Uh, but I uh, wish you a very good conference, uh, a very good meeting, a very good virtual meeting in the next days and uh, some good events. And I hope uh, that you uh, enjoy silviculture also in the future. And I once again, thank you very much. <laughs>
um, uh, especially in the last years or in the last decade when, when the prices of uh, these assortments went, went up. Uh, and on the other hand, we had some activities in establishing uh, fast growing stands uh, of willow and poplar on agricultural areas. But uh, this is in Brandenburg uh, after my, or in my knowledge, it's maybe eight or 10,000 hectares uh, in total compared to 1 million hectare of forests. So there is a high pressure on forests concerning uh, the, the fuel wood question, uh, but uh, in our forest management approaches, we must be very careful to, to stick to the principles of close to nature forestry. So to, to still keep uh, also smaller uh, trees in the stands and maybe to use uh, a coupled product on, on, uh, or at every tree, uh, if you see the, the lower part of the stem, which may be a valuable part, you have a product uh, in the upper part of the tree, which can be a finer uh, part of the stem, which also can be used for these purposes. But in general, we should be careful and not uh, destroy the structure, the diverse structure of these stands. Uh, and, and use the, the smaller trees or the understory, which are very important uh, as structural elements, which are very important as uh, elements keeping a certain humid microclimate in the stands. Yeah. Okay, any <clears throat> comments on that? Um, then there were two questions um, about bark beetles, which I tried to combine. One was, uh, yeah, what are the biggest challenges expect um, for uh, spruce bark beetle and climate change related stuff? And also the question, has your timber production been damaged by the um, typographers, by the bark beetle in recent years? And is there any statistics or percent percentage of um, areas affected and I think we can combine this question because um, the bark beetle is also closely related to climate change and changing temperatures. Yes, of course, uh, we, we have uh, uh, in, in many areas, in many areas with spruce trees, we have the bark beetle problems. Um, and uh, as, as you may know, uh, with uh, drought years, and, and we have now some uh, drought years uh, since two years, and we are waiting for the uh, third drought year now in 2020. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, the fundamentals for also for the bark beetles to, uh, to spread uh, to with, with a very fast velocity. Uh, so what, what we see uh, in after every Drought year, we have also the problems with the spruce bark beetles. But this is more related to the areas with Norway spruce, which is not so much in Brandenburg. Of course, we have, we have uh, uh, beetle attacks also in, in Brandenburg. Uh, we have problems or we have animal problems or pest problems in, in Brandenburg forests with, with pine trees. Uh, Kiefern Brachkäfer, for example, or Nonne, uh, Kiefern Spinner, Kiefern Spanner. I don't know very well the, uh, the, the English expressions. Um, so we, we must see that uh, we, we have a, a strong connection between the, uh, the question of drought, of uh, devitalization of our stands, and the question of subsequent bark beetle damages. And if we do not establish good management approaches, so to, to harvest the, the trees before they can be damaged, um, we, we run uh, into, into huge problems. We can see this in, in the past when we analyze uh, 
some past pest periods, for example, after the Second World War in the 1947 and eight years, or in after 1976, after 2003, we can exactly observe the connection of bark beetle attacks uh, with uh, the production of, uh, of dry wood, of uh, timber, which, which died due to, due to drought. What was the second part was statistics. Is that correct? Um, yes, if there is any statistics um, or percent, percentage of um, areas affected. Um, I, I don't know at the moment. I don't know. Okay. Sorry. Okay, yeah, but... Because we have, uh, of course, different bark beetles. Uh, and we, we have to see which region in Germany uh, you, you uh, consider, yeah, and then you have, have different figures. Um, the next question is, is um, the pine still regenerated? Um, and I would just add to the questions, are there any trends or objectives, how this is going to change in the future if still yes. the pine will be planted? I mentioned uh, in one slide that uh, pine is uh, uh, regenerated naturally, if possible, because pine is, is only regenerated on the very poor sites in Brandenburg. So the forest development pine does not exist on medium and uh, fertile sites. On these sites, the uh, preference is, is lying on noble broadleaf tree species or beech and oak. But on the poor sites, on the sandy soils, we still work with pine. We uh, maybe somewhat open up the soils sometimes, and then natural regeneration is conducted. Uh, that is the uh, major uh, system of, of pine regeneration in Brandenburg, maybe on some 10 or 15 percent of the area which is regenerated. Um, the next question, I'm not sure if that was already answered but because there was a discussion going on in the chat, but uh, maybe you can also add your uh, experience, is um, at what age has oak achieved its target diameter and what is this target diameter? Yes, it depends a little bit uh, on the thinning intensity, but normally the target diameter of, of oak trees, of valuable oak trees, is 60 or even more, 70 centimeters at breast height. And uh, uh, if you um, thin heavily or intensively, you can reach these target diameters after 140 or 150 years. So you need still a long time for producing valuable oak trees because the, uh, the growth uh, pattern of oak and the growth velocity is not that uh, uh, strong yeah, or fast. So you need some more years than 100 years, of course. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I'm searching for the next question. Just a second. Um, yeah, that was actually what I, <clears throat> the most important I could um, depict uh, from the chat. And in regard to your map that you showed on uh, the last of your slides, we can also maybe exchange about challenges in your country as we have uh, in the Zoom meeting participants from all over Europe and also the attempts to close to nature forestry or how it is called in your country. And there was, um, for example, also one comment um, in Belgium, multi-purpose forestry is a different aspect. It doesn't necessarily mean continuous cover. And also the question, is there any difference between um, continuous cover forestry and pro-silver management? Um, no, exactly. Pro-silver management is continuous cover management. Um, 
because um, at least the enterprises, the forest owners committed to ProSilva in Germany, they try really to avoid clear cut. That is a very common uh, characteristic. Um, they, they do what I mentioned in, in one of the last slides concerning mixed stands and natural regeneration, but they try to avoid clear cut because clear cut is some uh, is a is a very severe interruption into the continuity of a forest so pro silver uh, europe is uh, sticking to uh, avoiding clear cuts as far as possible yeah um you also mentioned um the green book um, the guidelines for Brandenburg, also for forest conversion and close to nature um, forest management. And I wanted to ask if this green book is, uh, yeah, rather guidelines or legal prescriptions <coughs> that have to be fulfilled <coughs> in the future. And yeah, how are the trends in general um, in, in Brandenburg um, towards uh, forest conversion? No, the, the, the green book, uh, of course, these are guidelines. These are not strict prescriptions. Uh, but of course, the state foresters, they have to, uh, uh, to use these guidelines as an orientation. And they have to explain if they act differently, I would say. They have to explain it to, to the forest uh, authority or to the ministry if somebody is coming and looking after the forest. Uh, but it's not a strictly legal prescription, which maybe uh, exists in other countries. I know from Ukraine, for example, that they have to regenerate pine stands, for example, at the age of, uh, let's say, 85 years or so. And they have to do this. They have to really uh, stick to this regulation. But in uh, Brandenburg and in our other uh, federal states of Germany, the foresters can work with a quite a high degree of freedom. But of course, it's an orientation and they have to explain uh, and ha they have to have good reasons if they uh, act differently. Um, yeah, maybe um, if there's anybody we can open the room uh, for for discussions or contributions from different countries uh, if there are any guidelines or if you face uh, similar challenges or yeah how what what the um, current trends are in, in forestry in your country or maybe I also forgot a question then just uh, go for it and, and ask again. <laughs> Anna, I have just one comment and one problem. I have a a, a meeting in in ten minutes, so I have oh, to sure <laughs> to, to leave quite early now due to other obligations. Okay, of so course. Yeah, maybe we, we totally uh, understand. <laughs> yeah. So, are there still some questions? If there aren't any burning questions, then we, uh, then you can, of course, uh, get get the break <laughs> before the next meeting. And uh, yeah, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, thank you. And uh, for for the contributions to our conference online. I wish you all the best for the conference and uh, have nice. Uh, events and nice, uh, yeah, con have nice conversations, etc. So Thank all the best much. for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Same to you. Thank you, Hannah, for organizing this and for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye bye. Um, yeah. So I would say that we can stay. Um, for a while in the meeting and um, Mari or both.